Hello there, my name is Jere Lehtinen and I'm from Aalto University. Today I will introduce you all a very useful project scheduling tool called the Design Structure Matrix. Design Structure Matrix differs from other scheduling tools in the sense that it focuses on information flows instead of work or resource flows. The logic behind a Design Structure Matrix is that information flows are easier to capture than work or resource flows. Before going into the topic in detail, I would like to draw your attention to the key learning outcome of this video. So, after this video, you're able to apply design structure matrix on your own in project scheduling. Forming a design structure matrix consists of three main steps. First, you decompose the project into tasks. Second, you document the interactions between tasks and form a matrix. Third, you analyze the matrix and rearrange the tasks by means of sequencing algorithm to optimize information flows. In this example, an imaginary project called Project Alpha has been decomposed into tasks running from A to L. In total, this project has 12 different tasks that need to be executed to complete the project. Next, we need to document the different interactions between the tasks. Here, you find examples of the basic interactions that any two tasks can have. In the first example on left, task B is dependent on the information produced by task A before it can be completed. This means that tasks A and B are sequenced. In the second example in the middle, task A and task B are independent of each other, meaning that they can be executed in parallel, that is, at the same time. In the last and third example on the right, tasks A and B are interdependent on each other, meaning that they both require information from each other. These tasks are called coupled tasks that should be completed at the same time in close collaboration. All right, here we have documented the interactions of Project Alpha and formed a matrix representation. So, how do we interpret this matrix? Well, in general, rows indicate the information that different tasks require. In turn, columns indicate the information the different tasks produce for other tasks. I will give you some examples. For instance, row D means that task D requires information from tasks E, F and L. In turn, Column B means that task B produces information to tasks C, F, G, J, G and K. OK, let's move on to the third step. In the third step, we rely on sequencing algorithm to optimize the information flows between tasks. The sequencing algorithm begins by identifying candidates for the earliest and latest tasks. In an ideal situation, the first task would require no information from other tasks, making it a suitable candidate to start the project. Respectively, the last task would not, pro would not produce any information to other tasks, making it a suitable task to finish up the project. In this project alpha, we can see that task B requires no information from other tasks, so let's move it up as the first task. Please, remember always to move the respective column as well, so that the diagonal follows correctly. What we can see is that task G produces no information to other tasks, so let's move it to the end. Please, remember always to move the respective row as well, so that the diagonal follows correctly. Alright, so now we need to sort out the rest of the tasks to optimize information flows. In general, the idea is to move the columns and respective rows so that the cross marks will be below the diagonal or as close to the diagonal as possible. The logic is that inputs are easier to capture than outputs. When we achieve a situation where the cross marks are below the diagonal, it means that all the tasks are sequenced. And as you remember from, from slide 4, sequenced tasks need only information from the previous tasks having no feedback loops from successors, making the project more straightforward to execute. So, how do we achieve this? Well, first we try to identify any information feedback loops between tasks. Then we move the tasks that cause information feedback loops as upfront as possible in the matrix to eliminate 
or minimize information feedback loops. We repeat this until all tasks and loops are sequences, sequenced if possible. So, in practice, this is a kind of an iteration exercise. Let's practice this together. First, we can identify that task C requires information from task B and provides information from task A. In turn, task A is dependent on the information from task C, but task A does not produce information to task C. So we should move task C up before task A. Next, we can see that task L produces information to tasks D, F and J, so we should move it before them to move the cross marks closer to the diagonal and below it and to minimize any information feedback loops. From now on, you continue with the same logic. The key idea is to continue identifying these information feedback loops and eliminate or minimize them by moving tasks in the matrix. All right, so now you should have enough guidance on how to solve design structure matrices by yourselves. For those who are interested to learn more about the topic, I have listed some further readings in this concluding slide. So it's time to conclude this short video about design structure matrix. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new and I'll see you in the next one.